So, I'm excited. I'm always excited. I get built up in the Word, and I'm ready to uh, release it. So, I was praying this week, and I was like, okay, Lord, you know, especially with all that's going on. And I'm like, Lord, should I change course? And, uh, you know, and I was just kind of working at it and looking at it, and there's a few amazing Bible stories in regards to some of the things that are going on in today. And I thought, oh, you know, these are really good, and I was grabbing hold of them, but I really felt like the Lord said, stay course, stay the course, amen? And as I started to look into where we're going in chapter 15, so we are in 2 Chronicles 15, um, I started to really see some things in it that really pertain to today, that really give us encouragement. And I just, I'm, I'm excited because it encourages my heart, and um, you know, especially with all the uncertainties that are going on right now. And I just want to let you guys know, first of all, the, the title of the service is called God's Spark. So look at your neighbor and say, you're God's spark. <laughs> yes. Okay. Let that sink in for a minute. God is looking for his children to ignite. Ignite. Okay? I'm a recovering motorhead. I love, when I was a kid, my, my dad was a motorhead, and he loved cars. And I love tearing apart cars. I wasn't so good at putting them together sometimes, <laughs> but I could tear them apart like nobody's business. I love to see how things work. And, um, but by working on cars and snowmobiles and dirt bikes and anything that had a motor, um, I've come to learn a few things about how an engine works. And one thing I learned, um, if you don't have spark, you don't have ignition, you don't have power. That's where everything begins is within the spark, within the cylinder that creates the explosion. And God is looking today for children that will be that spark because he's staging the scene right now. He's staging the events of what are going to unfold for this generation and the generations to come. But he's calling his children to be that ignition point within this world. To, to, to create a spark. A spark of hope. A spark of faith. A spark of trust. So that the rest of the world can see God's move and His work and His goodness over His children. But we have to walk this out in faith. We can't be fearful. We can't tuck tail and hide and run. We need to get out there and we need to be expressing what God is doing because he's doing something, something that I've never seen in my lifetime. And I, I've even asked some, um, some people that are older than me, and I, I, I use that term lightly. So, but yeah, I just, I really wanted to know, like, you know, is this something that you have seen in your lifetime? And they're like, no, this is something very unique. And, I, and, I, and as I started to think about that, I just think about the opportunities that God is going to create for his church to minister to the world, and that I believe that God is creating a, a platform for a harvest. I believe, he start, I'm, I, I believe that's what he's doing right now, is he's creating a platform for a harvest, because we are in the end times. We are getting so close to the end times, and God is going to start to show himself in, with waves of mercy. Now, we don't know how the waves of mercy are going to come, but he's going to start to show himself to start to prepare the church and to prepare the world for his second coming. And this is a wave of mercy that we're seeing happening. It's his call to the world to respond to him. I heard a prophecy not too long ago. Somebody shared with me. And it was, about, um, it was about how God, for 2020, and it was how God was going was gonna to shut down the NFL and shut down sports arenas and all sorts of things. And I heard a lot of mockers and scoffers say, that's impossible. You're talking a billion-dollar industry. And God sends, God allows this virus to come in, and it shuts down the world. Shuts down the world. Shows his power. Amen? Amen. The other thing is where I really pulled from this, this message is, is from watching my kids this week. 
my son Xavier and Michael have been just spending time because Kathy works in the tax industry, so she, so Michael comes over to our house a lot, and um, they wanted they just you know they're kids they want to explore they want to do something but they don't know what to do. Go outside and play, guys, please. You know. <laughs> That's what I tell them. Just, just go out in the woods. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, I had so much fun out in the woods. Go out in the woods. They'd go out in the woods and look at each other. <laughs> and then they would come in and they would be like, there's nothing to do. <laughs> then I'd go out there with them. I'd be like, man, there's so much to explore. I remember when we were kids, I would start reliving some of these things that me and my brother did in the woods. And they would be like, oh, and they'd get really excited. I'd go in the house and they'd follow me in. And I thought, this is unusual. Why aren't they grabbing a hold of this? So I decided to go out there, and I'm like, okay, show me. Let's build a fort. Let's do something. And they're like, okay. So they're like, Dad, we need, we need some. We need, like, plywood and hammers and saws. <laughs> and I'm like, guys, you're missing it. You've got to use what's out here. I mean, they're searching, the, they're ready to tear the siding off the house is what they're ready to do. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, we, I need to work with this here a little bit. I got to show them how this is done. So we kind of, I find this spot where I can kind of watch from the house, but you know, it's far enough in the woods where they're independent. And um, I'm like, okay, like I'm showing them like there's a fallen tree. I'm like, we got to get some sticks and, and make a lean to and then get some more sticks and lay them over them and and, you know, just kind of build this fort out in the woods. So I start doing it, and I start showing them how it's done. And, and literally, it starts to take shape a little bit. And then we start throwing some leaves on. And, and then I finally, after an hour or two of helping them, I say, okay, guys, you guys got this figured out. And they're getting excited. And I walk in the house, and sure enough, they didn't follow me in. And I look out the window a half hour later. They're out there working hard and diligent on this fort, and, and they're excited about this thing. So now every day they come home, it's like, oh, we're, we're going outside. we got to build our fort, Dad, and don't let anybody else know where it's at. But it took that spark. It took that vision. It took that, that, that step to, with them, that I had to walk with them for a moment to show them how it looks and how it comes together. And I think that's where God wants his church the world doesn't know how this, this is all fits in. And God says, I want you to walk alongside of them and start to show the world what it looks like to be a Christian. To show the world what it looks like to, to have peace within, no matter what's going without. You know, to, to be, be thankful for the things that we have in the here and the now. And to know that, our, that we have a good Father, a loving Father that supplies all of our needs according to His riches and glory. I was walking through Walmart because me and my wife wanted to walk, you know, we were just kind of talking about what we were going to do last night. And I was like, and they were saying, let's just go to Walmart and just see what's taking place. I'm getting booze already. So <laughs> that's okay. So we go into Walmart. I just wanted to see, because this is something unusual, and just everything's bare, you know? I mean, there's stuff in certain spots. You can get chips and beer, but you can't get, you can't get toilet paper and the, the, some of the necess necessities. And, um, you know, I was just walking through one of the aisles, and I was sharing it with Pastor, and I just really felt like God gave me that vision of all these, all these shelves just full, overflowing with stuff. And God was like, you, you don't understand that I have every need already provided for my children. All you have to do is ask, and it'll be there. And we get so worried about how the world's going to supply for our needs when we have a Heavenly Father that says that, look, I have everything you need in abundance, more than you can even ask or even imagine. So we don't have to go in the discount aisle, right? Amen? Amen. 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 And we see this happening. So, so that's, this, that's kind of the, the basically the structure of this message. Is I really want to encourage you not to allow, to miss this opportunity where God is, is fueling. Just like an engine has to have fuel jump, dumped into the cylinder. 
and be prepared with compression to explode and ignite. I believe God is, is fueling this earth right now. He's fueling it and getting it ready for when God's church moves, there will be an explosion and a revival if His children respond to this opportunity. I really, really, really believe that. And the more He fuels it, the worse it gets, the more opportunity we're going to have. The more pressure builds up, the more possibility there will be for a great explosion to take place and great revival to take place. But it starts in here. It starts with us. It starts with that, that, that glimmer and that hope and that, that, that joy that God has placed within our hearts to do that. It's crazy to me. As I was thinking about this uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus, and you see the world just going into to, to this, this tailspin of fear. And the, morality, the, the mortality rate of, of it's 2 to 4% or something like that. And, um, and I was thinking about that, you know, and how it's just changed culture overnight. It's changed culture overnight. Everything has changed overnight. But they've, they missed the point. They missed the point that the, mora- the mortality rate of sin is 100%. 100%. And they ignore the spiritual warning signs of sin. But they, they, they take heed to these these, these, these signs of, of, of this, this virus that has no, it cannot touch our, our souls, it can't touch our spirits, it can't change our thoughts if we don't allow it to. Amen? Amen? And if we started to listen to the Bible more than we listen to the media, imagine what would happen. Because the world is just tuning in to the, to, the, to the media right now. And they're buying everything that they're selling. Buying everything that they're selling. Every bit of it. They're soaking it in. My phone rings all the time. And it, it's people asking me questions, you know, do, you know. And they're silly questions, some of them. But if we really tuned into what God was saying, we, would, we wouldn't be fearful. God, I love what Carrie shared. God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. He's given, us a, he's given us power and love and a disciplined or sound mind. We need to exercise that, though. That's our responsibility, correct? correct. That's what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. Amen. I've just, I just, just, just been wowed by it. Just been wowed by it. And uh, just watching how God is going to shape this. And it's just fascinating me right now. The only really... You know, and then you see the shelves just being emptied of, of toilet paper, which is, I don't even understand that, <laughs> and cleaning agents and stuff. But we need to be running to Christ, right? Amen. He's the only clean, his blood is the only cleaning agent that deals with really the result and the effect of sin. Amen. That's where we need to be going. People should be grabbing hold of that, and it's free. It's been given by grace. Amen? How great is that? How great is that? So if you guys have your Bible, I just want to go to this. And this is just amazing. And so we are in Chronicles. And we're going to see how God uses Asa as his spark. And how it changes the the nation. And really... uh, it changes history from that part moving forward because God used him and he responded to what God wanted him to do. And we're going to see this amazing reform that takes place in chapter 15. And we've been kind of going up to this. And up to this point in chapter 14, there's this massive war that takes place. Asa is faced with uh, these Ethiopian army or this Arabian army that comes in to wipe him out. And he goes to the battle lines with his 500,000 and faces a million Ethiopians that are that are equipped to the to the tooth. They have chariots and they have they have the best of horses, the Arabian horses that we've we've heard about in history. And they're ready. These are marauders. 
that were highly skilled at that, that taking over entire nations. Entire nations. And he stands before this incredible multitude and he cries out to God. He says, it's nothing for you. Even if we have the least, it's nothing for you to bring the victory to us. We call upon your name. We call upon the victory of the Lord. And the God moves mightily and he, and he delivers them. And he delivers them. And this is what I want you to see. So many times when I read that, I'm like, man, if I could only see that in my life. If I could only see that deliverance and God moves in such an incredible way, that I could be that Asa. But I, what, I, what I miss is God has done that. He has done that in my life. For those who have received Christ Jesus, have been born again, God has had an incredible victory within our lives. An incredible victory within our lives. Far more than what we read on, these, on, the, on the pages of chapter 14. The odds were more highly stacked against us. The army of hell was waging war and holding us captive. And literally, Jesus Christ had to step down from the throne of heaven, take on flesh, and allow himself to live a perfect life, blameless, and be nailed, willingly nailed to a cross in our place. It was an incredible cost. And that is the victory at which we stand at right now as believers in Christ Jesus. There's nothing left for us to do but believe. But believe. We need to allow God to transform us through His grace in our life. Amen? And we start to realize the incredible, the incredible victory. And it creates celebration. It creates rejoicing within our lives. Amen? 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 Amen. And it empowers us. Just as it empowered Asa, and we're going to see that, it is going to empower us. We have a story to tell. We have a story to tell. We have victories that have been purchased. By a loving God for us to tell the rest of the world that they have that opportunity to. They have that opportunity to. Amen? Amen. So I just, I just wanted to share that with you. Because all of Satan, all of the fallen angels have waged war against us. They did not want to see us freed from their captivity. But God has done something unique in his children's life. Unique. Precious and special. And we have that within us. I love this. It says, and I was reading it, just was, it was out of Zechariah 3, 2. It says, is not, it says, is this not the brand plucked from the fire? And it was talking about this priest Joshua. And, and, he, and he was standing before, and Zechariah, this prophet, was having this vision of him standing for the throne room of God. And, and Satan was there accusing him, saying he's filthy clothed and all of these things. And God responds to him, well, is he not the, the band that I plucked from the fire? That is me. That is you. God stuck his hand in the fire and pulled us out and rescued us. Amen? I love, as I was reading that, John Wesley, at the age of six, was caught in this tremendous house, house fire. And he was going to perish in it. And this, this, his house was inflamed in the middle of the night. And these, this neighbor, these neighbors came over and they rescued him. And they, got, they climbed on each other's shoulders until they could get to his window to, to draw him out of the window to rescue him from the fire. And when that happened, when that happened, there was somebody that saw and witnessed that that drew a picture for him of that, that exact same scene. And they gave it to little John Wesley which was this incredible evangelist for Christ. And on the day of his death, he still carried that with him. And underneath that picture, this is so powerful because it transformed his life. He started to understand what Christ has done for him. From that moment moving on, it says, the brand, the, 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 
it said this. It said the, the brand plucked from the fire. He realized he was that brand plucked from the fire. It was the mercy of God that rescued him. Rescued him from ensuing danger. And if it wasn't for the hands of mercy that reached into that fire and drew him out, he would have perished. If it wasn't for the loving hands of God that reached into the fire, and drew us out, we would have perished. That's our story. That's what empowers us. Amen? It's, a, it's such a great spiritual victory that we carry that is a spark within us. It's a spark within us that empowers us to change the world. To change the world. We complicate it so often as Christians, but it's not complicated. We just have to share the fact of the matter of God's love for each and every one of us. Amen? amen. Okay, so, amen. So, Asa, here we are in this incredible victory. And you would think right away, all of a sudden, there's going to be some high-fiving happening in Israel right now, celebration over this incredible victory. But immediately after this recording in, in chapter 14, it goes on. It says, Now the Spirit of God came upon uh, Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear, Asa, in all of Judea and Benjamin. So he's saying, Hear, King Asa. And all of you people, listen to my words. The Spirit is moving within me, and I have to release God's voice over you. I've got to release his plan over you. And he says this. You would think he would say, congratulations. Good job. Way to stand up to the enemy. But he doesn't. He says, the Lord is with you while you are with him. And if you seek him, you will be found by him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. He will forsake you. And you would think that, that King Asa would have took offense to this. Think about this incredible victory. He just stood in the presence of a million soldiers coming against him. And he called upon the name of the Lord. And, and the Lord delivered him greatly. And he gets back to his kingdom. And they have this incredible plunder and God enriches him from this victory. And you would think that the, the prophets of God would come and just be like, man, great job. Great job, Asa. But he comes back and he says, don't forget. Don't forget who gave you that power. Don't forget who won that victory for you. Don't forget who you must abide in. You must stay within his presence. You cannot depart from you, can't afford to do so. And so often, I think as Christians, we come and we have an encounter with God. We call upon his name and he rescues us. But from that point forward, we go back to our old self. And God says, don't do that. I got incredible plans for you. I got incredible purposes for you. I have things that you're going to do to bring deliverance to other people. To other people. You're going to be that spark of revival and reform. But you have to stick close to me. And God has that plan, I believe, and that purpose for each and every one of us in this room. At whatever capacity, I don't know. But I know it's big, and I know it's powerful, and I know it's precious. Amen? And so he says you have to abide. You have to, stay, you have to stay, stay humble. And that was a fault because if you go back to the other kings we just studied about, they had major victories too. But all of a sudden, pride came in. And after pride comes in, comes the fall. Comes the fall. And they ended up serving other gods. And they ended up going... Um, and drifting apart from God. But God loved Asa enough to send a prophet to tell him to stick close to God. Don't give up. Don't let go. Continue to, to draw upon his presence. And it says, for a long... So then he goes into this 
So he tells him this. So he gives him that three-part message. And Asa could say, that's generic. That's generic. You see all over the Bible similar things that are written in, in, in similar topics of, you know, be found, don't forsake him, and seek him. But he didn't. He accepted that personally to himself. He took that as a challenge. And then he gives him a history lesson. He says, for a long time, Israel had been without a true God, without a, a teaching priest, and without law. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. So he gives this history lesson to uh, Asa. And he basically says, he says that you know in the past, you know how these people have been found in, in difficult circumstances and they turned to you and they sought you and you, and they, and you were found by them. We've seen this in America, 9-11. We've seen this. It's all playing out again. But God is saying right now to us, abide. As they come in, we need to continually stick close to Him and trust Him because we cannot compare this. Now, as you're going to see, we cannot compare what happened in the past to what He wants to do in the future. And I believe that's what He's saying. Don't compare what is happening now to what's going to happen in the future. Grab a hold of that. Because it says, and in those times there was no peace to the ones who went out, nor to the ones who came into the land. So the nations were destroyed by nations and city by cities, and God troubled them with every adversity. Every adversity. Every adversity. But you, and this is what I love, and this is, what I, this is where I want to get to, but you... But you, I'm going to get to this in my notes because I don't want to miss, miss what I'm trying to say here. God has a plan for each and every one of us. Each and every one of us to be used for His kingdom. And He was, he was breaking this down to, to a personal prophecy over Asa. And I believe that this prophecy is for us too. God commands us. And what does He command us to do? Is exactly what He's commanding Asa to do. But you be strong. And do not let your hand be weak. For your work, your work shall be rewarded. Amen? 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 So you be strong. You don't fear. I haven't put the spirit of fear in you as as. Carrie stole from my notes this morning. <laughs> Perfect love drives out all fear. Come on. That is what God is doing in His children. He wants us to be a witness. He wants us to be a light. He wants us to be the salt of the world. But how can we be that if we don't walk it out? If we don't believe, if we don't trust? we got to know that He's a good God. We got to know that he's got good plans. We got to know that he will reverse everything that comes upon us. He is a redeeming God. He is a redeeming God. And anything that we have to endure for a moment or a season, God will reward richly to his children. So no matter if this, this virus comes upon you or not, which I believe it will not, because I stand in faith, and I believe what Larry says out of Psalm 91 and so many others that he talks about, and I'm going to stand on that promise. It doesn't mean I'm um, irresponsible. It just means that I'm believing that what God says is true. And until he tells me something different, I will stand on his word. Amen. I will not be moved from his word. Amen? I don't have to fear what man is fearing. They can't come against me. It can't come against my household. Psalm 91 says, Only with my eyes shall I see it, the reward of the wicked, because I have made the Lord my God my, re my refuge, my refuge, and the Most High God my dwelling place. Amen? That is our promise. 
And I want to encourage you guys in that. We can walk boldly. And also, not only when this tragedy, this, 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 this pandemic is happening, not only do we not have to worry about it coming against our own home, our own body, or our own family, but we also can stand in faith and confidence that we can walk through this world and, and, and put hope in others. Place hope in others. Share the gospel. We're going to have so many unique opportunities to share the gospel. So many opportunities to share the gospel. The people that weren't open before to it. And now they're longing to hear. They're longing to listen. It's going to open up some opportunities for all of us. But we cannot be weak. We must be strong. We must have faith. We must walk this out. And, we, and our hands must not become weak. We've got to continually press in on his presence. We've got to continually believe what God is going to do. Regardless of what's taking place, and it seems like the world might be falling apart, we hold on. We hold on. We say, this is not going to end this way because God has promised victory. He's promised that I'm a more, not, not just an overcomer, more than an overcomer. That nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing, Amen. not no plague, not no evil, not Satan himself can separate me from the love that God has for me. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, <clears throat> so grab a hold of that, and, and your work shall be rewarded. You will see your family, you will see your neighborhoods, you will see your church revitalized. It revitalized as we go forward, moving in on this. And it says, and when Asa heard these words of this prophecy, it says, when he heard these words, was you hear these words right now that are being spoken over you, it says this, he took courage. I, 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 I kind of was looking at that. Courage is for us to take. Courage is for us to take. It's for us to take. We have to grab hold of it. God has set it before us for our taking, but we have to take it. We have to exercise that. We can leave it there. We can get fearful. We can feel defeated. We can, we can believe the lies. Or we can take faith. We can take courage that God is offering us as he's offering uh, Asa and believe in his promises. Believe all, the, all of these things are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And say, that is for me. We can take that. That is our responsibility to take that. He took courage. And it says he removed the abominable, or abominable idols, which means the things that the Lord hated, from all the land of Judah and Benjamin, and from the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim. And he restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. Then they gathered in all of Judea and Benjamin, and those who dwelt with them from Ephraim, uh, Manasseh, and Simeon, for they came over to him in great numbers. Great numbers. I believe, and I'm just prof I'm pro proclaiming that now. I believe that God wants great, a great harvest in this time. A great harvest. And he's looking for those who will stand in the gap, as Pastor talked about yesterday. He needs men and women that will be willing to be used, just as Isaiah says, here I am. Use me. Use me, Lord. And when we walk through Walmart, we just need to be quietly praying in our mind, God, open up an opportunity. If there's somebody you want me to speak to, just give me the courage to, to speak to them and just say, hey, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. You know, I know I, I serve a, a, a mighty God, a living God that lives within me. And I walk, I walk in peace. This isn't shaking me at all. And let me, just, let me just encourage you. And it might just open up a conversation that you would never expect. All of these little things because, you know what? It's just like when he says, don't let your hands grow weak. It's just the little things. Some little steps of obedience that we take place. So often we think, oh man, I'm missing it really, really bad. 
how can God use me? How can he use me to change this country or even just my neighborhood for that matter? And just like the kids, you know, that were building the fort, it just takes one little step, one little spark. Amen? Amen? Just one little spark. And you don't know what that spark will do. Next thing you know, you might have an incredible castle built in your woods. You know? You just don't know. And God wants to do that work, and he wants to use you to initiate that, that movement. Amen? Amen? Amen. I love that. And what happens through this story? I'm not going to go because we're just running out of time. Revival happens in great numbers. It says they enter into this incredible covenant to, to seek the Lord with all of their hearts, it says. With all of their hearts. Rejoicing and worshiping Him in, 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 a, in a magnitude that we haven't seen before in, in the previous chapters. And it says God was found. God was found. They pressed into his presence. I believe God desires to be found. That is his heart is to be found by his children. And the more we press in and the more we walk this out, the more we believe and the more we just take small little incremental steps towards him, the more it pleases our Father's heart and the more He reveals Himself to, to us. Psalms 84 says, For those who seek after Him, they set their heart on a pilgrimage. On a pilgrimage, it says. We are on a pilgrimage set for heaven. Set for heaven. Amen? Korah's, done the, Korah's there. And she's looking down right now, probably saying, Guys, if you only could imagine what is taking place right here in this party that I'm celebrating in with my Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen? Receive that. That is our destination. And let's take as many as we possibly can with them because we see this incredible revival take place. The whole country starts to rejoice. They seek Him. They find Him. They are empowered by them. And it says at the very end that there was no war until the 35th year of the reign of Asa, which meant 20 more years of peace. God gave them a double portion. Before, when he started removing the altars, which we talked about last week, removing the altars of our life, I'm smiling at Blake because he's, he took seriously that message. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm putting you on the hot spot right now. He's, he's eight days into not smoking, so he tore down an altar. So, uh, praise God. And I just, even just talking to people, I'm hearing people literally changing their lives, changing their lives and their behaviors and their attitudes because... God has just put a, a calling on their life. And it pleases Him. Amen? Amen? And I just love seeing victory all over the place. But it all began. It all begins with a spark. And you're that spark. Don't ever us, never underestimate what God has planned to do through your life. Don't ever underestimate that. You be that man and you be that woman that goes into that gap. It says in Ezekiel that God seeks after those who will stand in the gap and build the wall. Build the wall. Because others will follow. That's what I believe. Others will follow. What can your spark that God put in you begin in others? Amen? Amen. Amen.